Atheist Nomads episode 393, Rebuilding the Wall with Casey Brink. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. And in the second half of the episode, I'll be joined by Casey Brink. And I know I recently said that I should probably be splitting up interviews from the main episode or news stuff. But this is one of those times where it's like, yeah, it was it was just an update. So it's not particularly long, so it's just going to be the last part of the episode. So it was a really good discussion on, you know, like, one of the things that I was, you know, talking about after the Biden inauguration was that there was a whole lot of Jesus stuff in there and, you know, taking all the congressional leaders to mass and all that kind of stuff. I was like, okay, so what should, how should atheists feel about this? And and we talked about that a couple times, and I, I penned him down on an answer. So um, it was a really good discussion. It's really good to hear about the work that the Secular Coalition for America is doing. When we have people in control that are receptive to that, it's not just a bunch of people who are kowtowing to evangelicals and the religious right. So things are looking better. Things are getting better, and hopefully we will have more new progress. Before we get into the news, though, I do have an announcement to make. This is something I've hinted at for probably two years now, but the time has definitely come. Uh, I will be retiring the Facebook page. This is a process that will take a few months because I don't want to have any dead links on the website or in the RSS feed. I can update all of the links on the website in just one go with a single command. So that will be awesome. But there's also the RSS feed and I don't want broken links in that. So I am going to have to go back through uh, about 400 entries in Libsyn and update every single episode because I made the mistake of having links to stuff in the footer to social media. So, um, yeah, it'll be a few months. I will be gradually taking steps. Um, and, and it's one of those things where, to, to explain a bit more on it, I would have left Facebook, deleted my account back in 2016 or 2017, if not for the fact that the, the because of the podcast page. But engagement there, comments there, activity that's any more than Randy sharing posts and people randomly liking stuff doesn't happen much. When there are comments, they have a tendency to get really ugly really fast, too. And yes, the, the thing about Randy, yeah, Randy, most of the notifications from the podcast page is from one, per, one listener sharing posts. It's nice that somebody cares enough to be sharing the stuff off of that page, but it's one person. But that also makes sense because for like, what, five years now? Facebook doesn't show you stuff from the pages you like. You know, the, the Facebook page has, I think it's 3,800 likes, but each post only gets shown to 14, 15, maybe 20 people. That's not much. It's about as bad as the old Amazon affiliate links that I've had, where I don't really get anything out of it. The podcast doesn't really get much benefit. Listeners don't get any benefit, but they're getting free advertising. And in good conscience, I can't continue advertising what I truly believe to be one of the most evil companies in the world that is destroying everything. Uh, examples are the way they were used to manipulate people for the 2016 election and super ramping up polarization, political polarization. Uh, Facebook did most of that. Their involvement or the way they were allowed themselves to be used for Brexit uh, through Russian stooges paying them money and they're like, sure, we'll take your money and do your stuff. The spread of misinformation that has helped lead to major anti-mask bullshit that has really screwed up the pandemic response and a bunch of vaccine and COVID-19 misinformation that has been effectively promoted by the Facebook algorithm, their involvement with the Rohingya uh, genocide, and also their involvement with the spread of QAnon and the planning of the January 6th insurrection. Yeah, they... They booted Trump, suspended Trump. I still haven't seen if that's been made permanent or not, but 
that's way too little too late. And the only reason I still have an account on Facebook is because of the podcast. So it's time to let the podcast Facebook page that isn't actually doing anything for the podcast, just letting that go. So the first thing you'll notice is I will be stopping the sharing of news stories to the Facebook page. Um, if you want to follow that, follow us on Twitter. I might try and see if I can make Facebook worthwhile for personal stuff with people I know in real life and, and a few other people that I don't actually know in real life. And the public stuff will all just be on Twitter. Separating those two out completely, I think will be good, but in all likelihood, by the time I'm done, I will probably be just deleting my Facebook account. So yeah, um, there's that announcement. Got that out of the way. And oh yeah, so I'm going to stop the sharing of links to it. Um, I will keep up the podcast episodes getting shared there for a while. And then as I get the links on the website and in the RSS feed um, removed or updated to point to a blog post I'll have on the website, that will, after that, I will be ending it. Again, that'll take a few months. Oh yeah, and we also have a patron group on Facebook and that has never, that's only had a couple posts in the entire several years it's existed. So uh, that will be getting deleted as well pretty soon. So as we transition away from there, if you actually want to talk to us on something social media like, there is still Twitter and I will still be posting uh, news that I'm considering covering in the show to Twitter and trying to get more active there. We'll see. And we still have a Discord room. And if we get more people there, we might actually be able to have some nice conversations there. Uh, there hasn't been a whole lot, but uh, we could do more. And that would, be, that would be awesome. So now it's time for the news. Christmas Eve and Christmas. There was a pharmacist in Wisconsin who was intentionally sabotaging hundreds of doses of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. The Daily Beast got a hold of the now unsealed FBI search warrant for Steve Brandenburg. And what they've found is that he, you know, we're talking a 46 year old pharmacist. He destroyed 570 doses of the vaccine by removing a box of vials from the refrigerator at Advocate Aurora Health Systems in. Grafton, uh, Wisconsin, and just pulling them out of the refrigerator and leaving them at the end of his night shift, or during his night shift. He knew that this would spoil the vaccine because they can only be outside of refrigeration for 12 hours. And he did that twice. These doses that had been damaged through being past stability on being at room temperature were given to 57 patients. This guy is now claiming that it was a, it was just a, a, a spur of the moment thing he decided to do because he was going through a rough divorce. And please don't press charges because then he'll never get to see his children again. Oh, this one gets crazy. He is, he did this both nights twice, which doing it twice, that's not just a spur of the moment thing. That's something that you are intentionally doing enough to do it twice. He tried to guilt trip the co-worker who discovered this after he found out that she had turned him in and he got fired shortly after that. He's now facing felony and misdemeanor charges. He did this because he believes that COVID-19 is a hoax. He also is a flat earther who believes that the sky is a shield that's put up by the government to keep us from seeing God. He also believes that the vaccine is microchipped and that it will turn off some people's birth control, but it'll make other people infertile. Like this is somebody who is seriously, seriously in need of major mental health help and somebody who clearly is so unstable that he cannot safely do his job of being a pharmacist. You know, this is like what we're seeing with some of these crazy far right wing lunatic lawyers that have been working with with Trump, the Trump campaign, with all the election stealing conspiracies. It's that some of these people are so like, how did they, these are people who've completely lost all 
grasp of reality. And whether it's medication, counseling, or being institutionalized, they need help to try to get be brought back to reality. Like somebody that clearly insane, and I don't mean that in the derogatory sense, I mean that in the clinical sense that clearly this guy has some serious mental health problems. The odds that he would have gotten away with a bunch of really bad mental health issues long enough to get through pharmacy school and a pharmacy residency and working as a pharmacist for 15 or 20 years, I'm going to guess this guy, like a lot of other people, have had complete psychotic breaks thanks to the crazy polarization and brainwashing that has been happening on Facebook and Twitter and and YouTube and Gab and Parler. This is crazy. This is the world we live in. That professionals who have had decent, at least reasonably decent careers and really good jobs that require a ton of schooling are getting duped and conned and going nuts. But clearly somebody who, you know, even though he apologizes for the harm he's caused and says that his actions were inexcusable, yeah, the actions were inexcusable. Based on those actions, he should never have a license to do pharmacy ever again. But what's worse is the fact that he has no grasp of reality. And when people have a that bad of an alternate reality, you can expect that that is going to result in really bad judgment. And we keep seeing a lot of that in the news right now, where people who people have good intentions of doing the right thing based on a bunch of lies that they've been sold in a warped view of what reality is. Which fits with the next story. This past Saturday, a few dozen protesters carrying anti-vax signs briefly shut down LA's largest COVID-19 vaccination site. This group of protesters were being aggressive enough to force the fire department to block off the entrance to Dodger Stadium for 55 minutes while people waiting to get their shots were stuck waiting in their cars out in the parking lot. One sign that's in the picture in this, this article says, save your soul, turn back now. Some of the other signs were LA better dodge the vax. You know, Dodger Stadium joke. Um, one said COVID equals scam. The police identified them all as anti-vaxxers, but they stayed peaceful and no arrests were made. It didn't stop anybody who'd gotten in from getting vaccinated, and it also didn't cause any appointments to get canceled. Everybody did get their vaccine. A few people just had to wait a little bit longer. And this is a site that, assuming they have enough shots, can vaccinate 12,000 people a day. This is really important for getting COVID-19 under control in Los Angeles to help make sure that when they get more vaccine in, they can continue to administer shots. They're reevaluating the security plan for the site and working on setting up a designated free speech protest zone. <laughs> Arkansas has a bill that has now passed both the state house and the state senate's committee for state agencies and government affairs that American Atheist is calling the church super spreader bill. This bill would permit all houses of worship to ignore all public health restrictions. In the committee hearing, nobody talked about the harms or the risk that this could cause, and yet they're moving ahead with passing this to appease their constituents by allowing them to get sick and die. And this is happening. This is actually something that, you know, there are a lot of churches who are taking advantage of the favorable treatment that they're getting or ignoring the rules or publicly or publicly and vocally violating them as much as possible. And I even was hearing it from, from my parents uh, when I talked to my dad last. They haven't been to their church since this started. They've been doing the online meetings, watching the online services, but they haven't been attending in person. And COVID has been working through the people that have been attending in person. And at this point, all the elders and deacons have gotten it. And most of the members who have been attending church in person have gotten COVID. This is a church that, well, like most churches now, is filled with old people, where almost everybody there is old people. It's ridiculous. If you're my age or older, and you live in the Northwest, you've probably heard that the Idaho Panhandle is full of white supremacists and skinheads. Well, 
One Idaho panhandle white supremacist, uh, as uh, the Idaho statesman put it, Nazi sympathizer. <laughs> um, he left Idaho in 2018 to move to Libby, Montana. And leaving Idaho, he left Sandpoint, Idaho, specifically. Uh, and has been engaged in robocalls that are racist, anti-Semitic, and threatening. Like, he has used these robocalls that he recorded in 2018 while moving from Sandpoint to Libby, attacking black and Jewish politicians, a local journalist in Sandpoint, an Iowa community that was grieving the murder of a local college student, and he attempted to influence, influence the jury in a murder case against a white supremacist in Charlottesville, Virginia. In response to this, he has now been fined by the FCC for repeatedly violating the Truth and Caller ID Act by manipulating the calls to make them appear to be local numbers, like we all get all the time now. Uh, and he's been fined $9.9 million. And don't think this is just something that, you know, the 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 new... FCC headed by a Biden appointee. No, this was something started by Ajit Pai's FCC in January 2020 with a propo initial proposed fine of $12.9 million. They lowered it because he was actually able to prove that he actually owned one of the phone numbers he used, but all of the rest of his arguments were rejected. And so... Yeah, he only was able to get himself out of $3 million in fines. He's now been given 30 days to pay, and if he doesn't, this will be referred to the Department of Justice. This guy is terrible and horrible. No, oh, the, the journalist that he was targeting, um, that was the one that first reported on him when police identified him as the guy who was handing out racist propaganda at a high school parking lot in 2017. That's what got him driven out of town. And if you're too racist for Sandpoint, Idaho, god damn, you've got problems. <laughs> the Southern Baptist Convention has released a report that has been long awaited. This is no. the Southern Baptist Convention has released a the Southern Baptist Convention has released a report from a task force they commissioned to study the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. And in this report, they have concluded that it is, quote, or that it is a, quote, significant, that it is a, quote, significant distraction from the Great Commission and work of Southern Baptists. The reason for that is the denomination has lost more than a million dollars in donations from constituent churches that have left because of their disagreement with what's been coming out of the Ethics and Religious, Religious Liberty Commission. This has been because these churches have feared that there is a liberal drift in the denomination. The head of the commission, while being staunchly opposed to abortion and same-sex marriage, has opposed much of Donald Trump's policies and Donald Trump himself. And that's what really got him in trouble. The Southern Baptist Convention is the largest evangelical group in the world, and as we have you know, as, as I know I've said on the show quite a few times at this point, it's hard to tell where the where evangelicals, the evangelical movement stops and the Republican Party starts. And since the Republican Party is still bowing to Trump, so is so are evangelicals. And that means the Southern Baptist Convention has to as well. Chris Boyd is a first lieutenant in the Ohio National Guard and a chaplain candidate. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of what a chaplain candidate is, that is actually something that I was in the process of applying to become when I dropped out of the seminary. It is for seminary students and graduates, and by seminary I'm referring to graduate-level professional pastoral education, not what the Mormon Church does with high school students. It takes seminary students and graduates who are not yet ordained ministers and thus not eligible to be chaplains in the military, and allows them to get started, go through all the training, so go through officer candidate school and the chaplain, uh, go through the chaplain school. But he's in trouble. The military has a very long, long-standing rule that the military 
needs to stay nonpartisan and stay out of partisan politics. And so Boyd is now going to be getting investigated because of a Facebook post. He wrote, quote, This letter sent to all soldiers is just play, plain wrong and manipulative. There are so many lies in this memo. It is heartbreaking that the Joint Chiefs would publish such a deceptively seditious memo. They are either scared or are, or are in bed with the left. Both are bad because that would go against the values held dear by the military, such as, in this case, personal courage and integrity. That was the memo from the Joint Chiefs of Staff reiterating to soldiers to not be involved in insurrections against the United States and reiterating that Joe Biden had been elected president of the United States. That memo was very important at a time when there was pretty reasonable fear that there would be another attempt at an insurrection or that Trump would try to declare martial law or that there would be some other kind of coup. And it was important for the military to come down and say, no, power will be transferred as required by the Constitution on the date and time that it is supposed to happen. The military shouldn't have to specify that, but they did. They needed to. It was important. And, and a lieutenant in the National Guard thinks that that is sedition. Interestingly, if uh, he does get in trouble, he won't be the first member of the chaplain corps to get in trouble for this exact problem. And with this next one, I honestly don't suggest that you click the link. It is that disturbing. And way, yeah. So, <clears throat> the Archdiocese of Cologne in Germany completed its investigation of some child sex abuse at an orphanage that had been run by nuns within that diocese's jurisdiction in the 60s and 70s. They completed their investigation, they issued their report, they talked to journalists, but would not allow them to write anything about what they saw. Eight journalists walked out because they refused to agree to publish the contents of this report and thus were denied access to the report, which if you're going to invite journalists in and then tell them you can't write about this, why did you invite them in in the first place? The church is saying that they can't release this because it is, it is too bad to be made public, that it is so bad that it would do harm to the public to release it. And they might be right. Um, now, of course, they didn't want to let it get to the media, but several lawyers did get access to the 560-page report and shared parts with various news outlets, including the Daily Beast, who has the write-up that I saw today. What happened in the TLDR is the nuns running this orphanage rented out or sold, yes, sold boys that were in their orphanage. Priests, businessmen, politicians would give them money and they would let them do whatever they want with the boys. I didn't think at this point that it'd be possible to see a new story about sex abuse in the Catholic Church, and to be truly shocked, horrified, and viscerally disgusted by it. And for a happy story, the First Circuit Court of Appeals has ruled that, yes, the city of Boston can absolutely refuse to fly the Christian flag. That shouldn't need to be said. Um, they have three 83-foot-tall flagpoles outside of their city hall. One always carries the U.S. flag. One always carries the Massachusetts flag, and the third one flies other flags. Often it'll be flags of foreign countries or flags that citizens request to have flown. There have been flags for Chinese immigration, there have been Juneteenth flags, gay pride flags, but for a ceremony that was going to mark the signing of the U.S. Constitution, someone requested to have the Christian flag. Flying. And the ceremony was to talk about the contributions of Boston's Christian community to the city's cultural diversity. And the city said no. So he sued. He claimed that because the city allows private citizens to get flags flown, that it is a free speech issue, that they've made it an open forum, and thus they can't dis discriminate against him. Well, the court, in an opinion written by U.S. Circuit Judge 
Bruce Celia, an 86-year-old Reagan appointee, they decided that because those flagpoles are so tall, they're right in front of the city hall, and it's a flag that's flying alongside of the U.S. flag and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts flag, that having it right next to them makes that city speech. And the city has the right to determine what they're allowed, what they, what speech they're allowing to be viewed, reasonably viewed as being endorsed by the city, and that they are perfectly justified in refusing to endorse or establish religion by flying a religious flag, and that the city is fine to keep flying secular flags, i.e. flags that have nothing to do with religion, but not religious flags. I hope this doesn't get appealed to the Supreme Court, because I would hate to see more precedent get created, because I could just imagine them, the, 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 the current Supreme Court, deciding that, no, this is hostility towards religion. And that would, that would, oh, that would suck. But for now, <laughs> for now, we've got a good, a good ending on this one. And now it is time for the interview. All right, we are now joined again by Casey Brink from the Secular Coalition for America. Casey, welcome back. <laughs> Dustin, I appreciate you having me on the show again. Thanks so much. Yeah. So, okay, when we were talking back in October or November, we were talking, right. it would have been October, I believe, if I remember correctly, because uh, we talked about, you know, what's the going to be that Secular Coalition for America is going to be working on with each of the election scenarios. And, you know, what we talked about in greed was that if Democrats retook the White House and Senate and kept control of the House, that would be the perfect one. And well, that's what yeah. happened. Yeah, it is. It is. You know, a lot's happened since we last talked, and that is the the big thing that has happened. And we see uh, a great opportunity with the new administration, the new majority in the Senate, and of course, uh, maintaining uh, the Democrats maintaining control in the House. We feel like that is very beneficial to the things that we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And we are going to be very busy doing those things over the next right. 12 months. Well, and, yeah. and I think it is one thing since, you know, SCA is a, you know, nonprofit organization to make clear mm -hmm. that, yeah, the Democrats aren't perfect, but right now the Republicans no. are just such a horrible mess because they've... A absolutely not. They and just so, keep pandering to evangelicals. Correct. It, it, and the reason why I say that specifically is it, it, it more has to do with the last administration and the things that we're trying to reverse uh, that they did so, so terribly. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there was a lot of damage done and we are hopeful that we will be able to make progress with the new administration and the new Congress. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, Secular Coalition for America, you're correct, is a C3. We also have a C4 arm of our of our organization. That's the, the lobbying arm. And that's the arm that I I sort of uh, run there. I, I do my best. So, um, yeah, we're going to be extremely busy. We have our agenda that we put out last November. Um, it's very comprehensive. A lot of it, again, has to do with reversing a lot of the damage that the Trump administration did. So we're going to be busy. All right. So I've got some want to pick your brain on, on a couple of things before we get to the big plan. So sure. first one, uh, you know, I've, I watched Biden's victory speech and inauguration speech and also saw the news articles about him taking Schumer uh mcconnell mccarthy and pelosi to mass with him inauguration morning right you know another a catholic two baptists and a jew right to go to mass and it's like so you know biden definitely he's got some pretty religious -y stuff um he does what's what's your thought on is 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 he going to be really good for us or or what's going on with all this religious language he's using for talking about unity so, you know, I, I think it's no secret that President Biden, you know, has his roots in, in Catholicism and, and has spoken about that many times. Um, however, I think what we need to look at is where that comes into play with his policy decisions. And I think so far, at least, um, you know, with the numerous executive orders that he's mm -hmm. already put out, um, one on advancing racial equity and, and support for the underserved communities, 
uh, throughout federal uh, the federal government. That's something that we um, are, are hoping to insert ourselves into directly. Um, you know, his executive order uh, uh, on preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation, mm -hmm. you know, things like this sort of, uh, you know, speak to where his policy uh, is driven from. And I think that it's sort of refreshing to see that, you know, he knows how to separate his faith uh, mm -hmm. from, his, from his policy decision making. So, you know, we will sort of certainly keep an eye on that and, and, and do everything that we can to make sure that that stays, the, stays the case. But again, you know, his track record is long. Oh yeah, and, absolutely. And, and so we, we have, we have high hopes that, that he'll, he'll stick to, to what he's done in the past. The, the one concerning thing I would say that I've, I've seen with it is that that trend with all three of those is that he was using, he's using religion as how to get unity as the tool for that. Right. Um, do you think that's going to be problematic in trying to unify the country and leaving us out of that? Or do you think that's just him trying to bridge the gap to try to bring back the right? You know, I, I do think that it is part, it's, it's part both, right? So I think he's using all the tools in his bag to, to do whatever he can to unify the country. And at the same time, I think that, um, you know, we, we as a community, as the secular community, uh, need to ensure that we are placing ourselves at the table, right? So that's exactly what the Secular Coalition for America does. You know, our whole mission is to, you know, advocate for religious freedom as guaranteed by the First Amendment of the Constitution. You know, we work to bring respect and visibility to non-theists, uh, and we, with the help of our 19 uh, national secular organizations and, and hundreds of local secular communities, uh, we're able to make a real impact uh, on Capitol Hill. And so that's that's part of our job, you know, to make sure that we are inserting ourselves into that conversation. And that speaks back to a little bit what I uh, discussed earlier regarding the president's executive actions. and. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that advances racial equity and support for underserved communities throughout the federal government, we will be sending as a coalition uh, shortly here a letter to Ambassador Rice, who is the director of the domestic policy program. So that's something that we're excited about. And we uh, we have uh, high hopes that we'll, we'll have a seat at the table to make sure that the views of non-theists are represented and and uh, and carefully considered when when policy decisions are being made and that actually seems like you've already answered my next question which is going to be with all of the damage the previous administration has done we've got so many different marginalized communities that have it way yep. worse off than most atheists and other non-religious people you know especially white people straight white atheists have it pretty good <laughs> still compared right. to a lot of other marginalized communities and who Absolutely. gets who gets the priority to get things fixed and sounds like your goal is everybody gets what they need but we're going to be at the table exactly you know we we certainly don't want to drown out any other uh, marginalized voices we know that uh, non-theists are not the only marginalized voice at the table by any stretch of, of the imagination so you know that if you look at our 19 member organizations, a lot of them, you know, they all have a basis in secularism on some level, but many of them advocate for other things. So, you know, we we do want to help wherever we can and where, wherever we can insert ourselves to, to make sure that everybody is treated equally. Everybody has the same rights to, uh, you know, raise a family and, and, and make a living and, and do all of those things that are necessary to, to lead a good life, right? So mm -hmm. um, that's something that the Secular Coalition for America will always continue to do. Well, and, and also, of course, that would be important. And with if there's a lot of work being done on trying to fix some of the racial inequity, there are also black non-believers. Absolutely. And if they get left out of that, then there's a portion of that marginalized group that could be left even more marginalized. Right. 
No, you're absolutely correct. And so you speak to black non-believers, and one of our member organizations is is called the Black Non-Believers. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so, so right. Um, that, that's a perfect example um, of how sort of the non-theist and secular viewpoint crosses all barriers and and reaches into all uh, demographics of the population. And and we're proud of that. We really are. All right. So, so you're you're optimistic about how what can get done in the next four years. Um, what are the big policy pushes that you're you're working on? Like, what's the, what's the number one goal you want to get? Like, the first big thing you want done? Well, so are we talking wish list here? Like, dream wish list? <laughs> uh, most specifically, what is it that you're going to put the biggest effort into trying to get pushed through Congress first? Well, so I, I don't know. First, I think the first actions that are already being undertaken are the reversal of the Trump administration executive orders. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the, the president is doing a good job of uh, being very swift in his actions to do that. And we're, we're happy to see that, you know, a, a great example is the, uh, the no ban act. So, um, you know, the reversal of the, the Muslim ban. So yeah. that's, you know, that's a, that's a huge step in the right direction. Some of the bigger things that we'd like to see under taken of course of course do no harm the do no harm act is is the number one sort of legislative goal that we would love to see passed and signed into law um that what that would do it would amend the religious freedom and restoration act that has been uh, misinterpreted and misused to discriminate using the guise of religious liberty um you know, what the right calls religious liberty and what we refer to as religious freedom. There, there mm-hmm. seem to be two poly, polar opposite mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> interpretations. And we would like to see the Religious Freedom Restoration Act amended through the Do No Harm Act. I think it would do a great help and it would do a lot to end that discrimination that's been happening under that under that guise. So, so would that just add to it that you're free to practice your religion as you see fit, as long as it doesn't harm somebody else. Correct. Yeah. So like, uh, bakeries and gay weddings. Exactly. They, you wouldn't be able to discriminate based on religion, uh, in a, in a public setting. Okay. Right. Um, (laughs) And that's, it was, what's so crazy with that is the way that bill was originally written Nobody would have thought at that time that this is what it'd be used to do. Right. And so fixing it is, is necessary. <laughs> right. So, you know, Senator Schumer was the author of the bill, and he himself has come out against it. You, you know, it's misinterpretation many times and has stated, you know, that was not the original intent of the bill, and it's been perverted since then. So um, for lack of a better term, you know... It, we we really want to see the harm that it's done uh, and it continues to do to be brought to an end. And, and the Do No Harm Act is the way to do that. Right, because the courts are using RIFRA to justify they bending are. over backwards for the religious right. That's correct. And if RIFRA were amended, then they wouldn't be able to do that anymore. <laughs> exactly. That is true. Um, you know, that would put an end to the, to, to the court's and the litigation and and all that's gone on to allow people to continue to discriminate against others. All right, and that 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 would seem to be uh, an, an important um, block in rebuilding the wall of separation. Absolutely, um, absolutely. It's that's why it's the number one. Yeah, you know, it, it's the number one legislative goal that we would lo- like to see happen. You know, if. When the day the Do No Harm Act is signed into law, it'll be a, a very celebratory day in the secular community and the non theist community for sure. What do you think the chances are that it'll get through? So, well, you know, the fact that it was authored last Congress in the Senate, the Senate version of the bill was authored by Vice now Vice President Harris. So, hmm. um, you know, I think it'll still have trouble getting through the Senate. I think it can get through the House. I think uh, the the Senate's going to take some work. But the fact that it was the vice president's bill, I think that um, there could be some greater attention paid to it 
Yeah. Uh, so so I think if there's if there's you know it's got as good a chance now as it has ever had. So um, we're going to do everything that we can to make to, to to get it to pass. And that really is a good sign for how this administration will be for for our side. And Absolutely. The, the bill that you're wanting to that's the top of your wish list was written by the now vice president. Correct. That's right. Um, so that, that's a good sign. You know, yeah. that's certainly a good sign. And we wouldn't, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't expect it to, to get uh, not signed or, or vetoed or anything like that to get to the president's desk for sure. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure he'd sign it. So, yeah, we, we think now is as is, is good a time as ever to get that bill passed. Right. You know, we, we we did have a few legislative victories at, at the end of the last Congress. We had the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, blasphemy resolution mm-hmm. was passed, uh, both through both the House and the Senate, and the uh, Stop FGM Female Genital Mutilation Act was uh, signed into law. So we were excited about those two victories, and um, you know, we look forward to more on the 117th. Yeah, because you you got that through. Mitch McConnell's Senate. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> it isn't. It, you know, we had we had some trouble. We, it was some trouble getting uh, the blasphemy resolution to the floor in the Senate. But uh, we were finally able to do that. And, and uh, we saw it pass. And that was a that was a good day for us. All right. And then what are the, the other um, legislative initiatives that you're you're hoping to get this year? Or, or, or this from this Congress. Well, you know, so w- we certainly have our normal slew of legislative pieces that we want to see pass. Things like the Scientific Integrity Act, uh, the Preserve Science and Policy Making Act, uh, the Women's Health Protection Act. Um, but you know, with COVID nineteen still out there and uh, the vaccination is still rolling out. I do believe that the first half of this year, again, is going to be focused on COVID relief legislation. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, you know, when this all started last year um, and in the CARES Act, the first COVID relief package, they had the program, the pay, Paycheck Protection Program, which is administered by the Small Business Administration. Within that program and allowed for the first time ever for uh, religious institutions to receive federal dollars uh, that go directly to funding religious activities. So something that we are are going to continue to push against. And we would like to see the CORE Act passed, which would provide rigorous oversight on where exactly where that money is going, what it's being spent for, um, you know, all that good information. So that's something that we're going to be focused on. You know, I, uh, of course, as I said, we have our normal slew of, of legislation that we're going to be pursuing. But I do believe that, you know, with these relief packages coming up, they're going to be taking up a lot of uh, what we do in the yeah. at, at least the first six months of the year. So, you know, more of the same for, for right now, as far as that stuff goes, making sure that uh, taxpayer dollars, as, as much as we can, are not going to to religious institutions and and finding out exactly where those dollars are going when they do. So that's going to be a big part of what we do. So is is there a goal of trying to get that money back or is that just a defeat that that we have to accept? I think that that's a, a longer term sort of project to look down the road. Right now it's to, to find out, you know, that's sort of the having worked in the federal government for over 12 years both on the Hill and in agencies, um, that's that's the big trick, right? Once the genie is out of the bottle, it's really hard to stuff it back in. And so that's going to be a project that's going to take some time and, and some legislative figuring out, I'm sure. Um, but it is something that we do hope to hope to achieve eventually. Yes, is is reversing that, making sure you know, rebuilding that wall, strengthening it, making sure that uh, religious institutions are not getting federal dollars. We're going to do everything that we can. All right. Um. And and with the COVID um, relief, there's 
nothing specific that you're hoping to get into any of those bills, just you're trying to avoid anything bad getting in. Well, right. We'd like to see. So as the relief packages went through last year um, and, you know, additional packages were passed, the restrictions on the Paycheck Protection Program were eased uh, Mm -hmm. each time. And so eventually, basically, it's, you know, carte blanche, whatever you want to do with the money you can do, essentially. Um, So we would like to see uh, some language to strengthen up the restrictions on that, we would also say, again, like to see the passage of the CORE Act, which will provide oversight so we can figure out exactly where that money is going. All right. Um, and in, so I guess in July, um, is that when you're going to start pushing do no harm or are you already working on that? We're already working on that. You know, okay. we've already we've already started our meetings with uh, committee staff and have been uh, reaching out to member offices as well and, and working with uh, some of the staff on with our allies on the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, uh, the members there who are champions for free thought and uh, non-theist uh, equity and involvement. Um, they do a great job on that and we're very thankful for everything that they do. Uh, we've, you know, we're busy all the time reaching out, making sure that the secular and non-theist communities voices are heard, um, that our, that our views are being considered when policy is being made Mm -hmm. and, you know, wherever that happens, we insert ourselves. Um, again, I think, a lot of the work that we're going to be doing in the coming year will be involved on the committee level um, to make sure that the legislative actions that we want to see taken are done. And we're going to be busy. Like I said at the beginning of, of the interview, we're going to be extremely busy over the next two years, really, to be quite honest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then who knows what's going to happen at that point. <laughs> Right. But it, it, it's, it's sort of exactly. So it's, you know, it's the rush for the goal line right now yep. to get everything we can get done um, before the next go around. And who knows what, what will happen after that. All right. And then with the courts, um, are you looking at anything with those or is that other organizations focusing on that? So, you know, we, we do, absolutely lend our voice when there are, we have issues with with appointments to the courts or decisions that have come down or simply to educate uh, our community on what's happening things like that um but we do uh, the majority of our work is as far as the court stuff goes is through the support of our member organizations who have vast legal resources and teams who are very good at what they do and uh they are they sort of take the lead on the on the court stuff sometimes for right. us um but with the fulcrum on the supreme court being brett kavanaugh right uh, <laughs> that's that's not great <laughs> it's not it's not and you know when uh when justice ginsburg was replaced last year by justice barrett you know, we were on the steps of the court, making our voice heard, you know, making sure that we were not happy about the decision to rush and uh, and replace such a renowned and respected justice with one who would be the antithesis of her uh, judicial prudence. So, mm-hmm. you know, so, yeah, we we definitely are on the front lines when it comes to the courts and will continue to be so. All right. I'm sorry if you were looking for something a little deeper there. No, 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 I I wasn't. I, <laughs> I half expected you to just say FFRF and American Human Association are handling that. <laughs> no, they do. They do. And they do a great job. And that's exactly what uh, sort of what I was alluding to earlier with our, you know, yeah. our member organizations have those legal teams and the lawyers who are very adept at what they do. Uh, they do a fantastic job. And so whenever they talk about the courts or, or, or tell us what's going on, I certainly listen and and uh, and and pay attention and do what I can to support their efforts. Yeah. Um, and then I guess with the, the administration, um, how much contact did you have with the transition team? So we were in touch with, uh, a couple members of, of the team 
uh, early on and passed along our agenda to them, make sure they know what's happening, what's going on. Um, and also via our contacts on the CFC, the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, we worked with, through, through them with the transition team as well. So we wanted to make sure that the new administration, you know, had had our information, knew who we were and knew what we were trying to accomplish before they even got in the door so we could hit the ground running. All right. And, and so but but definitely sounds like you you do a lot of of your work specifically through the uh, Congressional Free Thought Caucus. <sighs> So in the past, that has been the that has definitely been the case, and will continue to be so. Um, however, you know, something that I would like us to do. Well, you know, we we of course want to grow the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, and as many members uh, who want to join, we would love for them to do that. Um, that said. We know that we need to make other friends, too, uh, and people who might not necessarily want to be on the caucus. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. again, I think a lot of our focus uh, for for this legislative session will be done with committee staff. Um, you know, having been a congressional staffer for over 10 years, I can tell you that that is where the work in Congress is done. Um, and wherever we can intersect that with our allies, um, uh, with individuals like members of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, we will do so. I think that is the best strategy going forward. You know, on many of the committees that we will be working with, you know, members of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus sit on those committees. So mm -hmm. that's always beneficial to what we're trying to do and, and what, we're, what we want to see done uh, policy-wise. So, right. um, Because yeah. con congressional committees have their own staff, right? They do. They do. They absolutely do. And um, I think a lot of times people don't realize, you know, exactly you know, your, your basic layman wouldn't know, you know, where that that work is done in Congress. And the fact that are, there are both two different, you know, you have member offices and you have committee offices mm -hmm. uh, and they do two both. They both do two completely different tasks. Um, and the things that we're trying to get done uh, we certainly want to see done on committee level a lot. So um, I look for look for us to do a new outreach to the committee staff and build building those relationships even further than we already have and uh, getting a lot of good work done in the next two years. All right. Um, is there anything you think I'm missing? So I'd love to just share uh, with your listeners um, if anybody out there wants to find out more about the Secular Coalition for America, please feel free to go to our website at secular.org. That's S-E-C-U-L-A-R dot O-R-G. Um, you can go there and you can find out about everything that we do and you can sign up for our, our mailing lists and, and get regular updates from us on what's going on on Capitol Hill and the things that we're doing to try to try to increase the uh, visibility and respect for non-theists across the nation. All right. And I'm going to bring it back to where I started before I let you go. Sure. With the, when we see and hear the nauseatingly religious language around unity from President Biden, do you think we should complain and bitch on Twitter or just roll our eyes and ignore it? No, well, I know. I don't think you should roll your eyes and ignore it. I think, um, you know, every time that our community raises its voice and expresses our displeasure at sort of, you know, the uh, pontificating from, from a federal position is good for them to hear. I think it's good for our elected officials, regardless of who they are, to be reminded consistently of the separation between religion and government and the wall that separates the two. So, um, no, make your voices heard and, and let them know. And at the same time, though, pay attention to the policies that mm -hmm. are coming out. Um, you know, it, it's one thing to say, you know, I'm a Catholic and and also use that position to deny uh, people contraceptive 
uh, benefits and things of that nature. It's another to say I'm a Catholic and then at the same time go out and defend uh, the rights for uh, to choose and things like that. So, um, you know, just continue to pay attention to what the administration does and we will as well. And anytime that we think that that crossover is happening, um, we will certainly make our voice heard. All right. Um, yeah, I know this was sh- way shorter than last time, but since it is, we were just on a couple months ago. <laughs> Appreciate the time and thank you so much for having me on. You're always a great host, Dustin. You do a great job and uh, keep keep getting the, the message out there, man. We appreciate it. All righty. Well, thank you, Casey. And uh, definitely have to hit you up in a few months for, for an update. Absolutely. Please do. I look forward to it. All right. We don't have any feedback, uh, but we do have a new patron, actually, that I missed last week. Um, I have a tendency to somehow always miss them and then remember when I'm editing and then making sure I get it into the next episode. Um, But new patron, uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Um, You want to contact us, you can use the contact form on the website at atheistnomads.com slash contact, or you can email us feedback at atheistnomads.com. Remember, it's feedback. That will be one you will have to type in. It will not be available in writing anywhere because the old one is getting way too much spam now. And in a few months, I will be getting rid of that. You can also always use the speak pipe button, which we love getting voice messages. And if you want to support the show, you can find out how at atheistnomads.com slash donate. Go to atheistnomads.com slash donate. And until next week, remember, not all those who wander are lost. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads. And yes, recording a new outro, dropping that one link is something that is on my to-do list.